New York Giants day three draft reaction. I just want to say overall, I'm very satisfied, pretty happy with this draft. I would probably, I don't want to give it a grade yet. We'll do it you know, towards the end of the video just for the uh, suspense. But the Giants had, I believe, seven picks today in rounds four through seven. So they had Darnay Holmes, number 110. Number 150 was Shane Lemieux. Number 183, Cameron Brown. Number 218, Carter Coughlin. Not Tom Coughlin's son, but that would have been cool. Um, who else? Uh, TJ Brunson, 238, which is actually a pick that I predicted on my mock draft. So that was pretty cool. Like, I... I, I'm always the person that says like doing a seventh round mock is pointless because you'll never get it right. And then what do you know? I actually got one right. So that's complete luck. I'm just going to go out there and say it was complete luck, but still pretty cool in my opinion. Uh, pick number 247 was Chris Williamson from Minnesota, cornerback. And number 255, a guy I just finished watching. I was actually pretty impressed with him, by the way. Tay Crowder, the linebacker from Georgia. So I'll go over all those picks from today. Um, I went over the first three picks the previous two days. I'll probably do a, you know, a video covering the entire draft probably tomorrow or something like that but for now we're just doing day three guys my opinion on them and let's get into it so round four pick number 110 was darnay holmes the cornerback from ucla and if you watched my second mock draft video i believe it was my first two mock drafts were just players that i wanted and darnay holmes was on that list i think i had him going number 99 overall not 110 but 99 overall um in my second mock draft so i'm actually very happy to have darnay holmes i was a big fan of him i spent a good amount of time watching guys that i thought would be slot corners at the nfl level i thought darnay holmes was one of those guys and you know some people were were kind of upset because they're like what happens to julian love but i always go by that saying i put this out on twitter as well i always go by that saying you can never have too many corners or secondary members you know like this in today's nfl with all this passing i mean i'm a big positional value guy cornerbacks safeties very value not strong safeties but cornerbacks free safeties guys that play you know the pass mostly very valuable positions so you cannot have too many of these guys i was very satisfied very happy with this darnay holmes pick so he graduated from ucla in less than three years which i find very impressive i don't know how you do that i'm in my fifth year of college so that's i i I don't know. I don't get it, but very impressive guys. So he's a smart dude. So I like seeing that. Of course, the things I like about him as a player, very physical defender for his size. We didn't go over his size, by the way, 5'10", 195, 29 and a half inch arms and uh, hands over nine inches. So, you know, not the biggest guy out there. not going to lie. Doesn't, you know, he's not going to be an outside corner at the next level. If I had to predict it, I do think he's mostly a slot guy. So we'll see how that works for him. That's probably one of the negatives about him, but he can't help it. I mean, he's still a very good player for what, for what God gave him. So, um, he just started, he started as a true freshman. So I like seeing that as well. He just turned 21 years old, still very young. Very quick player, good hips. He ran a 4.4840. I always say speed and uh, quickness is a different thing, but he's also very quick. I think he has both speed and quickness, which of course, when you play slot corner, very important as well as having very good, you know, quick hips where you can just like rotate and do all that type of stuff, have good movement skills. I think Darnay Holmes does all that stuff very well. I think he has good tackling technique, especially for someone that's under 200 pounds. He wraps up his tackles and watching some of these prospects, it's, it's rough to watch the tackling. I mean, I probably couldn't tackle any D1 college player, so I'm not going to say anything that bad about it. But, you know, for these guys, it's, some of the tackling technique was not that good. Um, he has all the tools to be a great slot corner. I mean, there are some late picks in the NFL that, you know, or mid-round picks, I should say, some guys that end up being really good slot corners. So, I mean, it's possible to take a guy like Darnay Holmes and, and turn him into a very valuable player on the defense, which is why it's so exciting to me. Um, he can be a good uh, return man if needed. He was a return man at UCLA and uh, did a good job at it. So if the Giants want to put him at returner, uh, it is possible, you know, as well as being a good slot corner, it could be a good returner as well. So as I said before, probably a bit undersized to play outside cornerback, which it does limit you as a player a bit. But I do think the Giants have such a need right now at that slot corner position that it's like, you know, you might as well just take it. Take it. So as I said before, people mentioned Julian Love and, you know, Julian Love is such a good guy so i don't want to say anything bad about him we actually had him on the channel um probably a few weeks ago he's an awesome guy but if i had to guess i would say darnay holmes is probably quicker probably faster as well so i do think he would be better in a slot cornerback role not to put anything bad about julian love but julian love was an outside corner at notre dame i think he did very well at free safety as well so i don't think slot corner is his natural position he might not be comfortable there he said he would do it but i just don't think that's where he would want to be if he had to pick so we'll see what they do with him I, I don't think you know I don't think it's said and done it's not like they took Holmes in the first round so 
But if I had to predict, he's probably the stock corner in week one. But we'll see how it plays out. I'm rooting for Julian Love. I love the guys, so no pun intended. But, um, yeah, I, I do want him to do very well, obviously. He seems like a really good guy. So back to Darnay Holmes. He struggled against the deep ball on occasion, some jump ball opportunities that did not go his way. That's something I noticed for sure. And, you know, being 5'10", I'm 5'9", so I cannot imagine being, you know, just an inch taller trying to guard these 6'4", 6'5", outside receivers. It, it's probably not going to go well for you. And that's what I saw sometimes on tape from him. And he could be better in man coverage, but it's not that bad. So, you know, watching him, it's like he does have some ability to stick with his receiver, but then there's times where it doesn't look so good. So I do think with good coaching and all that stuff he'll be fine I think this is a really good prospect and I was very happy with this pick it was one of those picks like Julian Love last year I was very excited when they took Julian Love this is another instance where I'm very happy with this pick he's a guy I watched a good amount of before the draft so I was very happy with this pick wasn't the biggest need for the Giants, but in terms of talent left on the board, I think he was pretty high up there. So I'm very satisfied with this pick. I'd probably give it like an A if I had to say right now, but um, Darnay Holmes for me, really nice pick at number 110. Pick number 150 in round five was Shane Lemieux, the guard from Oregon. He played left guard last year. A lot of speculation about whether he'll play uh, center, and the Giants did say they want to try him out at center. So it is, it's very possible. I do think that might be their plan. Part of me still thinks Nick Gates might be the center next year. I think these two will battle it out to see who is the week one center. I don't think John Jalapio or Spencer Pulley will make this team. I could be wrong about it, but they have so many offensive linemen right now where it's like, do you really need those guys on the team anymore? Like, Let's be real. I don't know. So we'll see how that one plays out, though, in uh, in preseason and all that stuff. So for Shane Lemieux, he's 6'4", 3'10", 32-inch arms, which isn't that big for an offensive lineman, you know, hence the reason he's a guard, and his uh, hand's 9.5 inches. So, you know, another offensive lineman. I mean, yeah, that's the third one they've picked in the first five picks I think it is yeah third one the first five picks so seems like a lot I mean Andrew Thomas is a week one guy I think Shane Lemieux is a week one guy I actually remember watching Shane Lemieux when I first started watching prospects as I tell you guys I'm not a big college football fan I just like to go back and watch the NFL pro ready guys that are going to be drafted so I watched Shane Lemieux about three months ago and my notes on him was he's probably going to be a week one starter I liked how strong he was I thought he was pretty quick for how big he was as well but I did have week one starter in there so I do think this guy has week one starting ability we'll see how the Giants feel about that one he was a two-time first team all pack 12 a very you know impressive accomplishment for him the things I like about him as a player very solid run blocker another pick that'll help Saquon Barkley so once again I just I love how it is two years later but I love how the Giants are actually you know um kind of investing in their investment if that makes sense like when you take Saquon Barkley number two overall and don't give him the line he needs to succeed kind of makes the pick look dumb but hopefully next year we actually see Saquon Barkley put up Christian McCaffrey type numbers and, and have this pick look worth it so that would be very good and I think uh, Shane Lemieux is a guy that can put that thing in the right direction of course Andrew Thomas as well as I mentioned before uh, very quick for his size I like seeing that very durable he started in like 52 consecutive games at college so that's that's really good to see of course you don't want guys with injury history like I like the guy like Natani Mootsi a bit more talent wise but like Natani Mootsi barely played like he played his most games in 2017 and had not played a full season since I think he played like four games the most you know since 2017 so too many injury concerns with a guy like that um, Shane Lemieux, he has the nastiness. You like a guard, a guy like uh, Will Hernandez has that as well. So I think Shane Lemieux brings some of that to the table, which is nice. Very strong base and hands. I mean, you don't you don't see him get pushed back too many times. I mean, I did have below this. Once he gets his hands on you, it's usually a wrap. Like there's some times where Shane Lemieux might whiff on a guy. In a game I watched, I forget who they were playing, but in a game I watched, a guy had a really nice spin move on him. You know, he kind of like reached for him, but the spin move happened already, so he missed him. But like when he gets his hands on you, he's very solid. Apparently, he did not give up a sack in like 500 something snaps this year, which is very, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I saw a tweet about it before. So if that's true, very impressive. Um, he did look a little, he didn't look as good in pass protection, but like he still was solid. I don't really have a problem with it. So people were saying that, but you know, we'll see how he handles it in the NFL. He seemed to handle stunts pretty well the game I watched or the two games I watched of him they ran a decent amount of stunts against Oregon and he handled them pretty well so I was happy to see that um I think yeah as I said once he gets his hands on you the reps pretty much over 
And I think he's really good at opening holes in the run game. I mentioned before, very solid in the run game, but I do think he's just very good at just opening gaps for his running back. He's very good at sealing off like the backside if he needs to. So he can pull, he can do basically all the things you want a guard to do and does it at a pretty high level. So, you know, Shane Lemieux is a guy that I think, you know, some people had in like their top three in terms of guards and some people had him in like the top 10. Some people didn't like him. So a lot of mixed reviews on a guy like this. I mean, I kind of liked him. I was like, and I don't see anything bad about this guy. So he also has cool hair. He has good flow, as they would say. So he does have cool hair. That's also another thing to look at. So the things I didn't like about him, his uh, combine was a bit underwhelming. So when you look at his combine numbers, I don't remember off the top of my head, but when the Giants took him, I went back and looked at his combine because I don't remember it being good. And it wasn't really that good. I mean, he ran like a five... What was it? A five five point one forty, which wasn't too bad for an offensive lineman, but everything else was like meh. You know, it wasn't really that good. It was below average as to what the rest of the class was doing. So, you know, you don't have to kill the combine to be a good NFL player. You know what I mean? Like we saw who's the right tackle for the Ravens? Is it Orlando Brown? That guy was awful at the combine, but now he's a starting right tackle on the Ravens and playing pretty well. So you know what I mean? Like there's examples of guys that do pretty bad at the combine but have good NFL careers. So it's not like worrisome to me. It's just better to be have a good combine obviously for their draft stock and whatnot but but yeah once you're drafted your you know combine kind of just goes out the window because you're already on the team so it doesn't really matter at that point it just goes into like where you're drafted and it really depends for their bank account not really for us so i mean you know for the giants they got them combine doesn't matter anymore to me so it's another pick that i did say this before but now that i think he might play center i might just take this away but it's a pick that might not help the giants in 2020 so i was thinking about it you know, Will Hernandez is 24, I believe. Kevin Zeitler just turned 30. He does have a pretty big contract that they could get out of next year. And I'm thinking about this guy as a guard, but now, you know, he had a video on his Instagram story, I believe it was, of him snapping balls. So, I mean, yeah, he could be a center next year. It wasn't when he did in college, obviously. But if he can play center, the Giants, of course, have a hole there. I mean, Nick Gates and him, I do think, will battle it out. So we'll see who actually plays. And if Nick Gates wins the starting role, then... There's not going to be room for Shane Lemieux unless a guy like Zeitler or Hernandez or even Nick Gates go down. So he might not help the team in 2020. I hope he does. I, as I said before, like twice, I do think he's a week one starter in the NFL. I don't think he'd like be a, a weak link on the line and stuff like that. I do think he can survive in the NFL right away. So we'll see what happens, though. So um, his technique's a little iffy sometimes. He just seemed a bit stiff and, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. But, you know, at the end of the day, he did get the job done most of the time. As I said before, did not give up a sack and the 500 reps or whatever it was so for the most part it's not too worrisome for me and his pass protection so I did mention that one before as well I do think he's a better run blocker than pass protector but at the same time he did allow some pressures but never allowed a sack last year so that's what you got to look at I mean yeah you can give up some pressures the Giants now have a quarterback that's pretty mobile so I'm not really too worried about the pressures as if it was you know if Eli was still quarterback you need your offensive line to be pretty close to flawless and you know so I, I think Daniel Jones would do a better job with stuff like that but yeah I don't really have too many concerns for a guy like Shane Lemieux you kind of know what you're getting here very good run blocker he'll be all right in the pass protection and he's going to be a day one starter I think so we'll see how it plays out if he's a center and plays at a high level that's a very good pick because the Giants definitely need that if not then you have a really good guard on the bench you know what I mean like you know worst case scenario you have yourself a really really good backup option with a lot of upside and we'll see how that one plays out so I'm happy with this pick I wasn't expecting it but you know he's a good player so I'm happy with it Shane Lemieux pick number 150 in round five for pick number 183 in round six, the Giants took Cameron Brown, a linebacker from Penn State. I don't think I watched Cam Brown in the pre-draft process. So, of course, I went back and watched a couple games because I don't want to just read a, a scouting report or something stupid. Like, that. there's no reason to do that. So, I like I like forming my own opinions on these guys and giving you some uh, some feedback on what I think. So, he's 6'5", 233, 34-inch arms. It's a pretty athletic dude, honestly. 9.5-inch hands. I think the Giants had three straight guys with 9.5-inch hands. I mean, it's something I really because I was putting it into the uh, the graphics, obviously, but just a weird thing right there, a weird coincidence, I would say. So things I like about him, very good length. I mean, when you're 6'5", 233, I mean, that's a very good size and just stature for a player like that, especially if a guy who might be an inside linebacker or an outside linebacker, I think he'll be inside, but he has the versatility to do both. He did run a 4.740, which is very solid for his weight. I do think he said he wanted to run a bit faster, so he definitely he could do it in his 
opinion, so maybe 472 was a bit slow for him. As I just mentioned, had some uh, versatility. He played a lot of inside and outside linebacker. I never saw him at defensive end in the two games I watched, but you never know. I think I think a guy at his size can definitely survive at defensive end. I wouldn't do it the whole game, but if you have to put him there for a few snaps a game, then so be it. Um, I think he's another long-term upside type pick. I remember Joe Judge had this quote before the draft even happened that was like we're just drafting guys for long-term upside and i'm like i like that you know i'm a big upside guy i've said this the last two drafts on this channel since i've been going over the draft i'm a big upside guy I don't want to take a guy that's already capped out. Like, that's kind of why I was against a guy like A.J. Epinesa because I feel like A.J. Epinesa is, like, such a man already. It's just, like, he's already capped out. Like, we've already seen the best version of A.J. Epinesa, and Epinesa could be a star in the NFL. I could be wrong about him, but I just don't see room for improvement as he gets even older in age. You know what I mean? But guys like this, you have a guy like Cam Brown who just seems, you know, just growing into his body i do think there's a lot more upside with a pick like this so i do like it from that standpoint he was decent in coverage and as i said he has upside i think he has upside to be really good in coverage he just did show some flashes that he can stick with guys in in pass coverage and even zone defense and pass coverage so i like that about him the negatives were he didn't excel in a particular area i didn't see him being a great tackler i didn't see him being great in coverage or anything like that yes he's a good athlete but it wasn't like he was devin white or uh you know some other crazy you know, Patrick Wilders or some kind of crazy athletic linebacker like that. So um, his uh, shedding blocks was a bit concerning. His strength is another thing as well. So when you're this lanky, sometimes you have issues with strength and shedding blocks, and that's kind of what I saw on tape for a guy like Cam Brown. Yeah, I think he has to wrap up better on some tackles. I mean, as I mentioned before, there were so many guys I watched from whether the Giants picked them or just guys in general that missed tackles. You know, it's just like it happens a lot in college. I have no idea why. I don't know if it's the coaching or whatever it is, but Cam Brown was a guy who just tried to lay out some hit sticks with his shoulder. Guys would bounce off of it, so like you have to wrap up better than that. Um, he could be over aggressive at times i did see at least two instances of him being in the backfield having a quarterback just left out to dry and he missed the uh, sack because he was just pursuing him too fast and was over aggressive so those are the downsides i think those are things you can fix when you have a guy like cam brown he has things that you can't teach he has everything you'd want physically as i said he's not devin white but that's why devin white went fifth overall and patrick willis went what, like 11, 10 overall, whatever it was, first round pick. So, you know, getting a guy like this in round six, I think has a lot of tools and I don't expect him to be like a starter right away. It's definitely a project, but you know, if someone went down in front of him, I do think he can fill in and do an all right job. I do think, you know, the Giants took a a few linebackers in this draft for sure, especially later. And Cam Brown's one of the more interesting guys because he does have a ton of upside. So we'll see how he works his way into this defense. Not exactly sure what their plan is, but it's interesting to see uh, how it plays out. He'll probably get a lot of run in the preseason season so we'll keep an eye on him but it's an exciting pick a guy with this much upside it's definitely exciting so we'll see how that one plays out cam brown round six number pick pick number 183 on to round seven and pick number 218 was Carter Coughlin, the linebacker slash edge player. He played four or three defensive ends. So I don't know why I put linebacker. I guess I heard it and maybe just put it here. I have no idea, but don't disregard that one. So I think in the Giants 3-4 defense, it makes a lot of sense for him to be an outside linebacker, probably in a two-point stance would be my guess. He did a lot of a lot of three-point stance and two-point stance at um, at Minnesota. So we'll see how it translates to the NFL. So he's 6'3", 236, 31 and 3-8-inch arms and 9.5-inch hands. Once again, the 9.5-inch hands pops up again. So the things I really liked about him, he ran a 4-5-7-40, which I think is pretty good for someone who's over 230 pounds. He can play defensive end or edge, just like uh, the last guy went over, Cam Brown. He can also do the same thing, in my opinion. These are guys, Joe Judge definitely hones in on versatility like the Giants every pick in this draft I feel like has been a versatile player like if you go down the list I'm going to do it right now because this honestly just had me thinking so Andrew Thomas can play both tackles Xavier McKinney can play in the box and play anywhere on safety Matt Pert left tackle right tackle experience Darnay Holmes can play inside or outside I do think he's inside but could play both Shane Lemieux any interior uh, offensive line position does not have long enough arms to be a tackle but can play each of the three interior offensive line positions Cameron Brown we went over defensive end outside linebacker Carter Coughlin defensive end outside linebacker TJ Brunson that might be where versatility stops I think TJ Brunson's definitely an inside linebacker 
I don't see him doing much more than that. I could be wrong. Chris Williamson, a guy that I think could play slot. He's a bit tall for slot. Like He's taller than most slot corners, but definitely, I think, has the ability to do that and play outside, so I'd say that's a versatile pick. And then Tay Crowder, they can do a lot with him as well. I do see Tay Crowder being an inside linebacker, but at the end of the day, very versatile player. So I would say most of these picks have been versatile guys. I just wanted to go through that list real quick. So he does have an explosive first step. That's what you know stands out a lot. And he sniffed out a lot of plays. I noticed that. I watched you know, a few games of him, and that's something I noticed. Like on screen plays and stuff like that, he would just sniff them out and I think had a really good football IQ, and people raved about that when reading when reading about him. Uh, good tackling technique. I think he has good hands, strong hands, and a good motor. Um, I like the guy Kenny Willekes from Michigan State who kind of reminded me of Carter Coughlin. Of course, I liked Willekes a bit more, but Coughlin kind of had those same traits. He had 20 and a half sacks in three seasons. So I think a lot of his sacks, I mean, this is why you can't just read the stats and assume a guy's a good player or not but a lot of his sacks were on stump plays of course he had plays where he beat guys inside or just beat them on a speed rush outside but there were a lot of plays where he was basically running a stunt and just had a free lane to the quarterback and that's not nothing against him it's just you have to kind of take these stats into context sometimes so you know good sack numbers and the things i didn't like about him not super strong i mean there are guys of course that play edge and defensive end that are stronger than carter coffin so it's not the end of the world though i mean being a smaller player you can use that to your advantage sometimes the thing that concerned me the most is that he had a breakout season in 2018 if you look at his numbers, I forget how many sacks he had that year, but it was a lot. And then his sack number got cut in half the next year. His numbers as a whole took a hit. So I don't know what happened exactly from 2018 to 2019. My thinking, unless he was playing injured, is that team started to figure him out and realized, hey, this guy's really good, so we have to game plan against him, and then he was less effective. So, you know, I know it's like there's more attention on you, which I guess is a good thing because it helps the other 10 guys on defense. But at the same time, if you couldn't figure out how to beat that and counteract their moves, then it kind of has me concerned that you're kind of capped out for your upside so i don't know we'll see how that one plays out though but it is concerning when you see a guy have a one really good season and then just take a step back the next year especially when you're in your you know early 20s so he, he could end up being a special teamer if his game doesn't translate so i don't think it's the end of the world of course having good special teams players with a special teams head coach you know with his background being special teams would be a good thing and i don't really expect carter Coughlin to be a starting player any you know anytime soon but if it does happen we'll see i mean i was wrong about ryan conley last year i remember sitting here saying like ryan conley is probably going to be a special teamer but you know so if, i know it was like three games only but i look wrong so far and i'm very happy i was wrong because he's a lot better than i thought he was so i hope i'm wrong about Car carter coughlin but to me, he just looked like a high-energy guy who's probably going to give you some good special team snaps. If he ends up being a starter at some point, that's phenomenal because that's a seventh-round pick, but I just personally don't expect it. So don't hate me for it. I just, you know, guys know I'm brutally honest. I just give my honest opinion. I could be wrong about it, but we'll see. But I do like this pick. I mean, he's a very high-energy guy, brings a lot of good stuff to the table, and uh, yeah, I've had a very uh, solid career at Minnesota. So I'm, de I'm definitely fine with this pick, and I really hope it works out. So that's pick number 218 in round seven carter coughlin the defensive end and probably outside linebacker once he gets to new york before we get to the next pick i want to point this out about carter coughlin so when i look at his stats here's what sticks out to me about the whole taking a step back last year so when you look at his passes deflected he had no or passes defended i should say i don't know is it defended or deflected defended his passes defended were zero in 2016 zero in 2017 zero in 2018 but in 2019 it went to four so he had four in his career and it all came in 2019 which has me thinking maybe they used him more in coverage last year hence the reason his sack numbers went down his tackles for a loss went down and all that stuff so I don't want to use that against him. That's what I mean. I could be very wrong about that. I did not, admittedly, I did not watch every Minnesota game from 2016 to 2019. So I could be wrong about that, but looking more into his stats because now I'm curious, like, why did he take such a step back? That's something I picked up on right there. So his pass is defended zero the first three years, then four in his final year in college. So that's a reason why he could have uh, taken that quote unquote step back. Now on to the next guy, TJ Brunson, the one that I happened to predict correctly, which I still find pr pretty funny, but still cool. So um, he's a linebacker from South Carolina, 6'1", 230. They did not give his arms and hands length, so we'll have to deal without that for now. So he was a tackling machine. He's kind of like the Blake Martinez of South Carolina, honestly. Averaged 7.3 tackles per game since 2017 always praised for his leadership qualities when he was at South Carolina. And another thing I like about him, he does not back down from anybody. Like he'll take on any blocker and just, just 
full on just go at you like he doesn't really care he doesn't back down from any fight or any block i love that about him he's another solid blitzer a guy who's had a couple of seasons of like nice sack numbers i think he had four sacks 2018 and then like three or three and a half the year before did not have any last year but once again that could be a scheme thing i don't know what these south carolina or minnesota teams are running so we'll see how this one translates to the nfl um you know he could be decent in coverage but does have his blunders as well like there are times where he looks all right in coverage and then times where he obviously cannot keep up with his guys i would not say that covering tight ends and running backs is his forte but he wasn't terrible at it i just would not count on him to do that at the nfl level very much he's more of a run stopper in my mind on um he's not a gifted athlete these are things i don't like not a gifted athlete once again you know Devin white patrick queen type guy is not a gifted athlete like that does bite on some play action fakes i noticed that at least a few times when watching him does have his fair share of missed tackles which of course at linebacker is not something you want to see so you know that's that's your job right there you cannot miss too many tackles but i, I saw a few instances of it and you know i will go over i think basically all these guys on film i'll do like a film breakdown of all these players i don't know how long it'll take to complete all that but at least you know i'm sure we have a lot of time on our hands in the coming months unfortunately but i'll go uh, over these guys some film breaks down film breakdowns and i'll show you guys exactly what i was talking about when watching these guys so we did have some missed tackles in my mind um he his strength at the next level could be an issue he does seem like a strong guy because he does take on blockers very well but at the same time he's not like overly strong so it could be an issue i'm not saying it is it, it, it could so be aware of that um so yeah for pick 238 i think it was a pretty decent pick i like this guy kind of reminds me of bj goodson in a way i mean it's not like the same player but you know kind of similar they're inside linebackers you know later round picks and you know bj goodson had i guess decent years here he wasn't great he was you know between starter and, and bench type players so he wasn't great but wasn't terrible either so you know brunson come in here and be a third or fourth string inside linebacker then i guess they're all right but you know at the end of the day i think someone's got to get cut because i don't think brunson it'd be weird if brunson and uh, crowder made the roster i don't see that happening who else did they take a linebacker I mean, Coughlin, I don't think counts. He's more of an outside linebacker guy. It's going to be weird to see. I don't think, you know, if Cam Brown, Tate Crowder, and TJ Brunson all make the roster, I'd be surprised. I think at least one of those guys has to go, unfortunately. So I don't know which one it'll be. I don't want to think about cuts because that's months away, but I do think it'd be kind of odd to take – you know, three guys at the same position playing inside linebacker on top of already having David Mayo, Blake Martinez, and Ryan Conley. Like, you're not going to keep, like, six or seven guys at the same position. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I just don't think there's enough room on the roster to do that. So, that might keep them as practice squad guys. I just don't see them all being on the active 53. So, once again, for Brunson, like the pick. You know, he's a, you know, a good leader. He's not that versatile, probably the least versatile guy out of this group, honestly. But at the end of the day, he's good at what he's good at. I mean, he's good at stopping the run, taking on blockers. He can get in the backfield and sack the quarterback sometimes. So I don't expect him to be a starter one day. But if he is thrown in there as a starter, I don't think he'd be that terrible. So that's something to look forward to. So TJ Brunson, round seven, pick number 238. Pick number 247 in round seven was Chris Williamson, the cornerback from Minnesota. He's six feet tall, 205 pounds, did not have the arms and hands length, but uh, we'll deal with that, as I said. So he did play for the Florida Gators in 2015-2016. Then he was not getting enough playing time. He did have some special team stuff going on, but wasn't really used as a starter. So he said, you know, forget this. I'm not wasting my college career. He wanted to play, of course. So he redshirted in 2017, then transferred to Minnesota for the 2018. 2019 season so the things i liked about him when watching him he does have the ability to play slot or outside cornerback so i mean as i said being six feet tall it's a little tall for a slot corner i mean those guys are between like five eight and like 5'11 usually, but who cares six feet tall is fine you can definitely last as a slot corner being that size so even in minnesota which i found really weird he was used as kind of like an outside linebacker on a lot of plays i don't know what they were doing there their defense was kind of odd it was like basically all zone defense and they were using a cornerback as a outside linebacker on particular plays so once again that feeds into the whole versatility thing i don't expect them to be an outside linebacker in the nfl at 205 pounds there's no way that would work but in college at least that's the way they were using him on some plays so i think he does a good job playing the ball once the receiver goes up for it he has good ball skills as they would say so he's always good at punching the ball out 
right, right at the um, you know right at the right time. You obviously can't hit a receiver before the ball gets there because that's pass interference. But he's always good at timing it right, so that's something I noticed about him. And he always uses the sideline to his advantage. So if he's playing on the outside and there's a deep ball, he always uses that you know outside out of bounds boundary as an extra like you know defender basically. So I like that about him. It's good awareness. It definitely shows good awareness. So that was good to see. Things I didn't like. Doesn't have great length. He doesn't, you know, he's not like a six two, six three corner with like really long arms. So I mean, that's something that's you know taken into concern there. And you know, he didn't have much production in college, of course. So going to Florida for two years, not playing much, and then transferring, didn't put up like the best numbers. So I mean, that's something that's a little concerning. I think that he played in a very like zone happy scheme. I guess as I mentioned, I only watched a couple of games of him, but when I watched him, it was like basically all zone defense. So I'm not sure how he would fare in like man coverage if he was asked to do that for a majority of a game or if he was a slot corner i'm not sure how he would do a man coverage he seems like he has pretty good feet so i don't think he'd be terrible at it but we'll see how that one plays out and i wish he was more aggressive and jump some routes there were some moments where like you know you saw a play developing and like you're like oh just jump it just jump it and like he didn't do it so i was like kind of like annoyed to see that part but um you know, i think his missed tackles as well can also be an issue his his stuck out a lot i was not a fan of uh chris williamson and his tackling so that was an issue for me of course tackling for a corner is not the most important important part of your job but it's definitely a plus and a benefit if you can do it so unfortunately i did not see it from him i hope it gets better at the next level i think of all the prospects i mean i'm probably like lowest on chris williamson unfortunately i'm just being honest with you guys i mean there's a reason these guys fall to the seventh round but at the same time i think it's worth taking a shot because you know i'm an idiot i could be wrong and i'm just saying like this guy actually could be a useful depth uh, depth piece in the future so you know i i think a guy like maybe sam beal you know he's on thin ice probably i mean the, Gi- the giants have a few corners here i mean i think grant haley i don't even know if he was cut yet but you know, Corey Ballantyne was pretty bad last year, so they could use some corners on this roster. And a guy like Chris Williamson that I think has the potential to play outside and inside, you know, with nickel corner or outside corner, he can be a good piece for this team, especially like, you know, depth wise, as I said before. So we'll see how this one plays out. I wasn't the biggest fan of watching him, but then again, I watched two games. I didn't watch his whole career. I know he only played two seasons basically, but, you know, hopefully the more I look into him, the more I'll see, and, and hopefully I'm wrong about it. But for now, I wasn't too high on him, but we'll see how his career plays out. So Chris Williamson, round seven, pick number 247. For round seven, pick number 255, Mr. Irrelevant of 2020, it is Tay Crowder, the linebacker from Georgia, 6'1", 241, no arms or hands length given once again. And by the way, for Chris Williamson, I know I said he had smaller arms, but like that's kind of just me looking at it with my eyes on tape. I wasn't like, you know, there's obviously no arm measurement for him, so I couldn't really like, you know, give a number out. But when I watched him, it just looked like his arms weren't that long. So I'm just, I could be wrong, but that's the way I was going off of it. So the things I liked about Tay Crowder, good program well coached of course when you get a guy from georgia you're expecting these guys to have some of the best coaches in college football hopefully the same goes for andrew thomas as well but even for our last pick here tay crowder i hope he had some good coaching i think he has good speed for an inside linebacker i like that a lot and honestly of all the seventh round picks i know it's kind of funny because he's the last one i think this guy is my favorite i'm trying to think who else we picked Brunson, Williamson, Carlton. I, I do think Tay Crowder is probably my favorite right now. I know it's only like, you know, the same day as the draft, and I probably have to digest this more and watch these guys more. But from what I saw, at least from the, you know, I, I probably watched two games each or even three of all these prospects, not all of them, but like the later round guys. I think, you know, out of those, the the round seven players, I'm a big fan of, uh, of um, Tay Crowder the most. So I'm pretty high on him right now. Of course, he could get cut and not make the team, but I did like what I saw from him. So his play recognition, I think, was very impressive. He was a guy that sniffed out some screen plays and stuff like that. He kind of knew where routes were going. There was one play, actually, where a guy was running over in the middle. It might have been Cole Komet. It was against um, against Notre Dame. And I think he just, like, just shot at him like a dart. And just he knocked the pass incomplete or something. It was a really good play, though. It showed his, like, play recognition. And just he knew where the route was going and just basically erased that whole play. So I like seeing that one. Um, I think he has potential in pass coverage for sure. I kind of just you know went into that a little bit but he definitely has good athleticism he didn't run a 40 so i don't really know what his speed is but he did look pretty fast on tape so i'll put that one out there he'd probably be like a four six four seven maybe type guy i really don't know but that's basically what it looked like so um i do think he has a lot to work with i think this guy has really good upside 
And if he's coached the right way, I do think he might one day be a starter in the NFL. I could be crazy about this because this is Mr. Irrelevant, the final pick of the draft. But I did like what I saw here. I, I do think there's a lot to work with. The things I didn't like was he could be a bit stronger and had uh, trouble shedding some blocks. There were some times where like a guard would get his hands on him and he was done for. But you know, for the most part, when he's out in space, I mean, he makes plays. So I like him. Um, he didn't put up staggering numbers in college. He did not play much his first two years. So that's something to take into account. But the last couple of years, his numbers got better, of course, as the playing time went up, but it wasn't anything great. You know, that's kind of why he went so late in the draft. And he had moments of tackling too high where he was like tackling guys on their shoulder, even like by the neck, it seemed like. So sometimes the tackling technique was not perfect. Once again, that comes down to coaching. I kind of hoped Georgia would have better coaches, but then again, I didn't like Andrew Thomas's hand placement. So I'm not sure if the coaching there is that great anyway. So um, I'm just kidding by that. I'm sure the coaches are fine, but as for Tay Crowder, I'm impressed by him. I do think for a final pick of the draft, I do think there's a lot of upside there to work with. Um, of course, I don't know if he's going to make the roster, but I do think he deserves a fair chance because I do think he has a lot of tools, and if they use him the right way, he can be a very good pick. So, you know, especially it'd be a good story if a guy picked, you know, the final pick in the draft can actually uh, make himself a decent career. I'm trying to think who else. I think that guy Ryan Suckup, who used to play for the Chiefs and now the Titans. I don't know if he plays there anymore, but he had a pretty decent career as a kicker. I know he was a Mr. Irrelevant pick. I'm trying to think who else there was. I, I honestly don't know, but at least a kicker got it. So if we can get a linebacker to be a Mr. Irrelevant, you know, pretty relevant player in the future, that would be cool. So that'll do it for this video. I mean, overall, I think my draft grade for this Giants draft right now, initial reaction on the same day is probably like an A or an A minus. I'm very satisfied right now. They handled the first round very well. Andrew Thomas was like my first love of this draft. Xavier McKinney, I think, was a really good value. The Giants needed a free safety for sure. I think McKinney was a guy that probably should have went in the first round, but got him in round two, so that's great news. Um, round three, where we at? Matt Pert, that's a, a guy with a ton of upside. I was a fan of that pick. He could be the future right tackle. Darnay Holmes, a guy I loved. I watched a lot of him before the draft, and I loved everything I saw from him, basically. No, there are some you know, not-so-good things, you know, playing the deep ball because he's shorter, but I do think him being a slot corner at the next level, it could translate very nicely for him. Shane Lemieux, super strong guy, very good in the run game, just a bulldozer. And, you know, I did say he did have some pass blocking, you know, issues and his technique. He does look a little stiff and upright sometimes, but for the most part, a really good player should be a starter in the NFL for a long time. Uh, Cameron Brown at 183, super versatile player. I was happy with that pick. Carter Coughlin, I mean, I'm probably – low on him i'm low on him and chris williamson that's the two guys i was not the biggest fans of you know that's why i didn't give it an a plus but you know honestly these are sixth and seventh round picks so it's not the end of the world for me no seventh round picks yeah both seventh round picks tj brunson i think a solid pick good leader good tackler well, he did have some missed tackles but he did have a lot of tackles on the stat sheet so i'll give that to him he had a pretty good play recognition as well so and tay crowder a guy i think is very athletic i think has a ton of upside and probably slept on in this class i'm happy he's a giant and I might be a little high on uh, Tay Crowder the more I talk about it, so I'll just shut up now. But um, yeah, I, I did like him for a final pick of the draft. I'm pretty high on Tay Crowder, so um, that'll do it for the video. So A, A minus for me, I would say for this draft. That's very good for me. Um, I think the Giants did a really good job this draft, and honestly, I'm not sure if it was Gettleman or Joe Judge calling the shots for this draft. I'm still thinking about that. I actually put out a tweet before, and 60% of the people said Joe Judge is calling has the final uh, call for the draft pick. So I mean, and we're just speculating, of course, but just it didn't feel like a Gettleman draft. You know what I mean? It, there was something different about this draft, and I do think it was you know heavily Joe Judge influenced. I'm not saying Gettleman had nothing to do with it, of course, but I do think the final call might have been Joe Judge, but. Maybe we'll get that answer in the future. I have no idea. But who cares? The Giants had a good draft. That's all we care about right now. I hope these guys have very solid NFL careers. As I did say, some of these guys will probably get cut. Like our seventh-round picks last year, Chris Slayton, didn't make the team, I believe. George Asafo Ajayi was on the IR with a concussion all year. Then he was cut because he couldn't pass a physical a year later. So seventh-round picks down the drain right there. So seventh-round picks, they don't stick around too often usually, but sometimes you hit on a guy, and I do think that uh, that Tay Crowder has a chance to be one of those guys and maybe TJ Brunson as well or our next BJ Goodson. So we'll see. Um, I'm excited, though. This was a good draft, and it could have been a lot worse. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. So let me know in the comments what you would grade the Giants for this draft. 
give me your favorite pick, your least favorite pick, all that type of stuff. And uh, I'll look forward to talking to you guys in the comments. I did not read the comments for the first two videos because it's a lot. I'm going to try and read them this week, and I'll try to get back to you guys. So thank you for supporting the channel as always. I hope we gain some new followers and, and viewers from the draft process. I know there's this is the first time we've had live sports in like two months, basically. So it's, it's not sports technically, but it's sports related. So I guess it's live sports, but... If we gain anybody else new from this whole draft process, that's awesome. I hope you stick with us and continue to watch Fireside Giants, all that cool stuff. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you for watching. Let's go, Giants. It was a good draft. I'm happy about it. So I'll talk to you guys next time.